of understanding as we read your words today. We're asking that relevant passages that really speak to our present needs and problems, spiritually and physically and materially, you will impress upon our hearts. Be with us, enlighten us, instruct us, teach us as we read together now. In Jesus' name, I pray. We'll continue with the reading now. The second book of Moses, called Exodus. The second book of Moses, called Exodus. Chapter 19. Chapter 19. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people, and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people, and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that ye go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned, or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people, and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, on the top of the mount. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mount, and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people, and spake unto them. 
chapter 20. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And all the people saw the thunderings, and the lightnings, and the noise of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed, and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, and thine oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. You have just listened to the Bible reading, and we need to take whatever we have learned to the Lord in prayer. Will you all rise up, please? Talk to the Lord in prayer. You've seen a commandment, a warning, an example, an instruction to obey, a promise to claim. Pray for grace that you will do as you have learned in the word of God. In Jesus' name, we pray. It's time for tithe and offering. Shall we keep standing? The Bible says, give, it shall be given unto you. Whatever you want to bless, the, will honor the Lord tonight. Deep your hand into your bag and pulses. Rest it up as you pray on it. Our Father in heaven, we want to appreciate you tonight for love that never fails. We want to give you all the glory because of this obligation. We we'll pray as we fulfill it, let the corresponding blessing come attend to our lives in Jesus' name. For in Jesus' name we are prayed. Please, you can drop into the bag that our leaders are passing across.
shall be about to cry for good and right must conquer and see that wrong must We now bring you choir ministrations from regions, states, and nations across the world.
once before a tyrant strong and they were told that he would spare their lives if they would renounce the name of Christ but one by one they chose to die the son of God they will not deny like a clear object But the cause of Jesus still goes on, and our time has come to count the cost. The road that I have trod has brought me near a goal, though oft it led through sorrow's gate. Though on all the way I choose, in my way. Submission to the will of him who guides me still is surety of his love revealed. My soul shall rise above this world in which I live. What 
I wish not to be. What I wish not to where be. I wish not to be. where I wish oh, to go. That I should choose my way. I should choose my way. The Lord shall choose for me. So let him be me go. I'll say, I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey when your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart I'll agree and my answer will be yes oh yes Lord yes and my answer will be yes Lord matter where you are, it's time to go up higher. You are not born to be the least. You have something big inside your chest. It's my privilege, it's my calling, it's my joy to take you from where you are to tell you, come up, come up higher. So, you need to stand. Stand tall as rising stars. And now, Something bigger than Jaffa is on ground. As an international evangelist, an ardent lover of children and youth, Pastor Dr. W.F. Kumi lands in Abuja this May 2023 for the Global Youth and Children Convocations. Stars 2023. It's your single opportunity to stand tall as rising stars. Come, meet Christ, a superhero. Thursday, May 11 to Sunday, May 14. 2023 with a special evening family revival on the 13th and climax family sunday worship on the 14th all live at the prestigious moshuda biola national stadium fct abuja pastor dr w f kumui will be revealing tested and proven secrets to set you on a star ride of solution has now come amen it's your moment it's your time you must shine to be a star. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again. Let us go again. It's, uh, it's wonderful when two of us can go together to visit those converts. Let us go, not let me go. Um, excuse me, I want to go and do visitation. Pick uh, a Barnabas. And if Barnabas is not willing to go because of one problem or the other, Silas is there. And then Paul and Silas can go together. Let there be two of you, two sisters together or two brothers together. That's the practice of those days. That's still the practice today. It says, let us go and visit our brethren in every city you'll be so faithful that when either we have a great crusade and then many people came to know the lord and now you have been given some cards and can we follow people that we were not those who brought them to the lord of course yes of course yes because silas was not involved in the missionary journey in the missionary team and in the evangelism but now he was going with paul to follow up on those people and then it says that we're going again and visit our brethren in every city don't miss out anyone where we have preached the word of the lord and see how they do second corinthians chapter 7 verse 6 nevertheless god that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Here is another person that Paul sent whenever he couldn't do it directly himself. 
they should have brothers and sisters cooperating with you, walking along with you, that you will not say because you are too busy. This fellow will not be followed up. Give the car to a trusted sister. Give it to a trusted brother who can do the follow-up alongside with you. Titus came back and gave a report and said, those converts, they're standing. They're remaining in the Lord and of the Lord. See, that's effective follow-up. It must begin immediately. The new convert uh, comes to the Lord. What are the ingredients and the components of this follow-up? Number one, persistent prayer. Number two, personal contact. We're personally contacting them. We ought to, we must, and we must do it with urgency. Number three, purposeful correspondence. There are times you write to them. And Paul the Apostle will write to those new converts. And in this day of modern technology, we can use a telephone, we can use the email, we can use uh, all the gadgets that are now available. Number four, profitable Christian literature. Profitable Christian literature. They may be tracks, they may be books, they may be daily reading material that we are sending to them. Maybe a good Bible with a good concordance. We, we decide to buy for them so that they will be able to go and develop. Number five, pertinent, that means appropriate audio tapes. Pertinent, that means appropriate audio tapes. You are sending it to them or it may be CD that you are sending to them. Get them rooted in the scriptures. Get them rooted in the word of God. And we know that actually what we're hearing from these audio tapes or CD or DVD is actually the word of God. Number six, persuaded and persuasive representatives like Timothy, like Titus, like all the others, persuaded. And not only that they are persuaded, they are persuasive representatives. Number seven, passionate, patient Christians. Passionate, patient Christians. Not somebody that will beat them on the head and drive them and tell them you're too slow, you're not growing, and then they destroy those new converts. They must be passionate, patient, believers, Christians. Psalm 76, verse 11. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Let all that be round about him bring presents unto him that ought to be feared. Bring presents. The present you are bringing now is this soul. You have the card, you have the name, you have the contact address. He has given himself to the Lord and you want to present him on the final day before the Lord. And the vow you are making is this new convert that has not come to know the Lord, either through me or through you or through our brother there, through our sister there, or through the crusade or through our soul winning evangelistic outreach. Now you have the contact and you are the one to do the follow up and you want to present this soul eventually unto the Lord as uh, a person that you want to the Lord, we want to the Lord, and we're keeping in the Lord. I pray you will keep them, and they will not be lost. And on the final day, according to a consecration, commitment, and vow, they'll be with the Lord and be with us together in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Why don't you talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I will do it. I've heard your word. I commit myself to you, and it will be done. I will do it. The word of the Lord has come to us clearly through his anointed servant. The message is so central and timely. We need to dedicate our lives for scriptural follow-up to ensure that all the fruits of evangelistic outreaches are not lost. Look at what the Lord is doing through the GCK. Thousands of souls, thousands of converts every month. What is our role in ensuring that these converts are conserved? Let us pray that the Lord will stir up in every member of the church the zeal, the fire, and commitment to follow up as it was in the early church. As we get involved, we need persistent prayer for the converts. Don't just go anyhow, pray. Take time to pray for them. Also, there should be personal contact. Trace them where they are. 
You can use phone calls. You can use all kinds of social media handles to trace them. And then there should be purposeful correspondence. Send them messages through email, send them messages by calling them or call them, not just sending text message, you can call them. Establish purposeful correspondence. And then you can send scriptural literature, profitable literature. We can send to them Christian women mirror. We can send to them tracts. The church has enough scriptural resources for us to use for follow-up in this church. Let us pray that God will make us all involved in this great work of conservation of souls. Let us also pray that God will make all the members of the church persuasive representative, not just casual representative in this great work of follow-up, but persuasive representative. We thank God for this church today that came to us. Today, our vision for follow-up must change. We will value the souls of men, souls of women, more than ever before. We'll create time to visit them. Don't say, I don't have time. What are we doing that we don't have time to be involved in this great, great assignment? Then we shall adopt a variety of methods, workable strategies to ensure that the follow-up is effective. We're not winning these people for, for ourselves. We're not visiting them for, our, for, for ourselves. We do that for the glory of God. So vigilance is very, very important as you go. And then we must vow. And the vow today is, I will go. Can you say that? I will go. I will be involved. I will be, get, I'll be involved. The Lord will answer our prayers. And as we go, God will accompany our efforts with great success in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name, we we'll pray. Our Father, we thank you for this great message we have had today. Thank you for your anointed servant that has charged us very clearly. This message has come at the right time. If there's any time we need, this message is now. When you have blessed us, with thousands of converts through the GCK every month. And Lord, in the past, where we have been so careless, nonchalant about these converts, today we are repenting. And we are saying, Lord, we will go. Lord, we will get involved. Lord, we will not relegate. And Lord, we will not delegate to another person. So Father, as we go, I pray, Father, that through us, you so bring all these converts to real standing in the Lord, to be established in the Lord, so that there will be mighty army prepared in your hand, useful instrument in your hand for the end time harvest. Our Lord will pray that as we made a vow and we are saying we are going, Lord will keep our vow. So that at the end, Lord, your name will be glorified. Lord, we are so grateful for what you have done in our lives today. As we are going to listen to your word again from your anointed servant, Lord, speak to us. We are ready to listen. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' mighty name, we we'll pray. Amen. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your hands upon our lives.
Thank you for keeping us alive and healthy so that everything within, without, around, personally and our families, everything under our control will be handed over to you to serve and to worship you unreservedly in Jesus' name. We come to the study of your word tonight again, and we're asking, Lord, that your word will penetrate every heart, purify every heart, and attach us in full consecration unto you in Jesus' name. And at our lives, and every detail will be for your glory. Everything we say, everything we do, everywhere we go, everything will be to the glory of your name in Jesus' name. Bless us, Lord, tonight and give us understanding in your word. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And everybody will say good, good, amen. God bless you. You can see that we're coming to Daniel, Daniel chapter 3. And we're studying tonight from verse 1 to verse 18. Please open your Bible. Daniel chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height has, uh, was uh, three score cubits, and the breast thereof six cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. And then in verse 2, it tells us, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, and the counselors, the, the cherubs, the, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And then we're told in verse 3, in verse 3 it says, Then the princes and the governors and the captains and the judges and the treasurers, the counselors and the cherubs and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Come to verse 13. In verse 13, we're told that Nebuchadnezzar was in rage. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought those men. They brought these men before the king. In verse 14, in verse 14 it says, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true? O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up Verse 15, verse 15 says, Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, harp, sabbat, satri, and dulcima, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image that I have made well. But if ye worship not, he shall be cast the same hour. There will be no trial, there will be no delay. You will be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning, very furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Verse 16, verse 16, tell us she that Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful, we're not anxious, we're not calculating to answer thee in this matter. Verse 17, if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fairy furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hands, O king. Verse 18, now, 
in verse 18, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Obviously, you've had the story before. Obviously, you've learned quite a lot from this a portion of the Bible before. But today, the Lord is reminding us what we need to do, how we need to set our mind, how we need to focus our attention on God and God alone. That as we come into the kingdom, as we know him, as we reconciled unto God, and as we have the goodness of the grace of God bringing salvation, bringing redemption, bringing righteousness into our lives, that tests will come, trials will come, temptations will come, there will be solicitation to evil, but then we declare our strength. Already as we are born again and we are coming to the kingdom of God, we are consecrated to God. We're committed to God and we have opened our mouth that Him and Him alone will we serve. And now the test will come to try us and to test what we have said, whether we will or we will not. And here come Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, standing for the truth and standing for their commitment. If they knew the New Testament, what they didn't know, they would say they will earnestly, whatever happens, whatever does not happen, whatever the threat, whatever the trial, whatever the temptation, they will earnestly, wholeheartedly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now we have the word, the whole word. He has revealed his mind to us. And now that we are come into the kingdom, and the tears will come, the trial will come, and the threats will come, we should be able, by the grace of God, in the strength of the Lord, by the Spirit of the Lord, to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints, and manifest the courage, manifest the conviction on that trial. That's what we're looking at, that's this passage tonight. And we're looking at the topic, manifesting courage with conviction on that trial. It has to be personal courage, an experiential courage, something that we got from the Lord and nothing can take away from us on the basis of our salvation, on the basis of the approaching of the Adamic nature, that we have sanctification experience. He has purified us and we love him and we fear him and we're committed to him in everything and at all times. We have that personal conviction and the conviction brings courage in our lives. And it's not a hidden thing at a time of personal devotion, personal prayer, family prayer. I will say we're committed to the Lord. It comes out when you get to the marketplace and when you get to the public. And the public, in their principles, in their practices, they challenge you. And that is the time you manifest the courage. It's not when you are isolated, when you are alone, when nobody is challenging you. But when the challenge is there, when the difficulties are there, when the things that confront you and want to take the faith and the conviction away from you, that's the time you manifest the courage with conviction under those trials. Three points we're looking at today as we consider this. Number one, contrast between God's commandment and the king's demands. The Lord had given the command that should not worship any other God before me. And now the man, the king, the emperor, he has raised up a, an idol, an image in contradistinction, contrary to the commandment of the Lord. The contrast between God's commandment and the king's demand. Number two is the coercion of godly companions through the king's domination. He said, no, they were his um, citizens now. They have been brought to Babylon. He had even given them some level of education. He has given them work to do and has provided for them. He must not only dominate the secular, 
it must not only dominate their profession, it must dominate their heart, their mind, their spirit, their soul, and dominate and determine their destiny. He said, you are here in Babylon, and you don't have any decision of your own, you don't have any liberty of your own, I determine how you live, who you worship, and I determine where you spend eternity. That's where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego drew the line. They said, no, it will not be. We might work here, we might make our living here, but our eternity will not be in your hand. Our destiny will not be in your hand. They drew the line, even though there was coercion. They wanted to force them, and they wanted to kind of force them into worshiping, contrary to the law of God. They drew the line. The, line, the time comes in your life when you have to draw the line. When anything touches your eternity, when anything touches the destiny of your soul, when anything, whatever it is on earth, when it comes to the point they want to decide for you that you'll go with them to hell, that's when you draw the line. Whatever the pressure, whatever the pain, whatever the suffering, and whatever the consequence of what they try to do, you say, here I draw the line, you will not pass over that line to take my soul to hell. Coercion of godly companions through the king's domination. Number three is the comportment and the gracious composure despite the king's deadliness. That man was deadly. That man said, if you refuse to worship my golden image, and I've decided already, and there is no argument, there is no kind of uh, you know, discussion about this, it's either you do or you don't do. If you worship, that's all right, I'll release you. If you don't, I'll throw you into the furnace of fire and tell me, Shedak, Meshach, Abednego, who is that God that can deliver you out of my hand? They were calm, they were cool, they were well composed. They just said, go ahead and do what you want to do. And we will go ahead and do what we want to do. We will not do what we don't want to do because what you are telling us to do will lead us to hell fire. We will not do that. We're not going to get to hell on your behalf. That's for eternity. You can build your fire here. You can burn anything here. You can build the furnace here. But we will stand. And that's the commitment and the conviction that a child of God ought to have. That you hold everything, even life, you hold it with a loose hand so that nobody will say, this is what you love. This is what you like. This is what you cannot do without. And since you cannot do without this, then the aim at that thing to pull you and pull you to hell. We are going to heaven. You are going to heaven. And nobody will take heaven from you and then replace it with hell because of their threats and because the coercion and the punishment they threaten you with. Uh, look at number one here. Number one is the contrast between God's commandment and the king's demand. You know that already. God has commanded that will not worship idol. But uh, Nebuchadnezzar decided he was going to go contrary to God. If anybody is going to go contrary to God, he's not going to use me, he's not going to use you to fulfill his aim and to fulfill his goal. Look at three things here. Number one, number one, we're looking at great transgressions after a great testimony. Number two, great threats from a great tyrant. And number three, great trials with a great triumph. Look at number one. Number one is great transgressions after a great testimony. What does that mean? This man that set up an image of gold, this man that wanted 
himself and everybody to worship the idol. This man that threatened and said, if you don't worship the idol, the image of gold that I set up, setting himself up above God, against God. This man, look at the testimony he had given before this time, Daniel chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 47. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 47, the king answered unto Daniel and said, of a truth, it is that your God is a God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou Coldest reveal the secret. You know the story. We've well, studied it before. He had a dream. He had forgotten the dream. And he threatened he was going to kill all his wise men and the Chaldeans if they don't recover the dream and if they don't interpret the dream to him. None of those Chaldeans in Babylon, none of those wise men in Babylon could recover the dream. But Daniel said, give me time and I will get the dream back for you. And one night, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego prayed, and the Lord revealed unto them. And they came to the king and said, this is the dream. All the details of the dream, even his thoughts before the dream, everything that had happened to him during the day and now in the night, they revealed everything by divine revelation. And so Nebuchadnezzar himself said unto Daniel, and he said, of a truth, there's no shadow of doubt about this, that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of laws and a revealer of secrets. See, thou couldst reveal the secret which no wise man in Babylon could reveal. You could reveal that. You are serving a great God, the God of gods, is the, is the king, and the Lord of uh, the kings. Look at verse 48. In verse 48, then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then verse 49, in verse 49, it said, Then Daniel requested, requested of the king, that, and he said, Shedak, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the kings, in the gate of the king. Look at his great testimony. Look at his great declaration. Look at what he had said about the God of heaven, the God of gods, and the Lord of kings. And look at the, the, the great testimony that he now voiced and, and publicized that everywhere. That this is my confession about the God of heaven. And yet the man was not converted. I we need to be very careful when listening to somebody and he gives something like, you know, uh, uh, the God that works here, the wonders that he does, this is great. I've never seen anything like this before. And now they're looking for accommodation to come and stay in your house. And look at the testimony. Who will not accommodate somebody like this? Pray and think through. It's not what people say, it's what's in their heart. The idolatry in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar from, you know, from his birth, it's been put there by tradition, it's been put there by the family, it's been put there by his own acceptance of the idolatry. Even as a king, he was an idol worshiper, and he had all these magicians. All those things have not gone away from his heart. And now with a great testimony, this is a great God, this is a mighty God, this is a revealer of secrets. There's no God like your God. That does not convert anyone. Look at Titus chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 16. Titus 1, verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. In their behavior, they deny him. In their character, they deny him. In their secret, private, uh, private policies and practices, they deny him. When they come to the place of worship and they are with the people of God, and then they give this uh, flamboyant and great testimonies, and their utterances, they're like they're almost in heaven already. But their hearts have not been changed. 
their hearts have not been converted. It's the conversion of the heart in the private recesses of the heart of the man, of the woman, of the boy, of the girl. That's what shows that we believe in God. But look at this. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work think about that unto every good work every good work they are reprobates that's why you need to check off your own life too are you born again are you really converted is your heart changed or is it only the word that you speak in the public is it only the outward external manifestation or are you totally converted unto the Lord. We're told in Mark chapter 7, in Mark chapter 7, we're looking at verse 6. It says, he answered and said unto them, well, hath Isaiah's prophet said of you, hypocrites, Nebuchadnezzar was the biggest hypocrite in Babylon. And Jesus said, Isaiah's prophesied of you, hypocrites, as it is written, these people honoreth me with their lips. Honoreth me with their lips. God is the God of gods, and God is the Lord of kings. And yet he said, but their heart is far from me. The heart has not been washed. The heart has not been cleansed. The heart has not been turned around and transformed. Even though the you know, say that God is great and God is good and all that. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, and murders. In verse 22, verse 22 says, and tears, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Verse 23, it says all these evil things, all the evil things coming out of the heart, all the evil things that uh, Nebuchadnezzar manifested, the bad language, the blasphemous language, those are the things that come from within uh, and they defile the man. So a person may seem to have a great testimony and yet is still committing terrible sins and great sins in his or personal life those people do not belong to God. They do not really believe in God, although they shout high. They believe in God. When the Lord shall come and the trumpet shall sound, and the real Christian, the saints of God, those who are converted, those who are consecrated, committed to the Lord, when they will go to heaven, all these uh, loud talkers, all these people that project as if they're great, great believers, they'll be left behind uh, and they will suffer eternal punishment with the idol worshippers in hellfire forever. Let's look at number two here. Number two here, we're looking at the great threats from a great tyrant. The great threats from a great tyrant. And there are people that think that they make themselves God and they feel that somebody else's life is in their hand. And you say, you might claim to be born again, you are saved, you are, um, you know, a Bible reader. And then you believe all those promises. When I pass through the water, it will not uh, drown me. And when I pass through the fire, it will not burn me. But we will show you that you are higher and greater than the word of God. You seem to be claiming the gift great threats and their tyrants and they really mean to carry out what they have uttered that they're going to carry out. They want you to look up to them as your God. They want you to look up to them as the final authority. They say if you are going to live long, it doesn't depend on the word of God, it doesn't depend on how you live your life. If you're going to live a long life, it depends on him. It depends on her. And he issued a great threat. And if you don't know your God, if you have not been in fellowship with God, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you might uh, be threatened. If you think of life so much, and you think of the temporary life as very important, 
and you are not thinking of eternity. You are not thinking of what does God say? What will God do? And what can God do? Their threats will catch you. The tyrant will squeeze your life like they pluck the flower and squeeze the flower. But the Lord will give you understanding. And whatever they say and whatever they threaten, you will stand for the Lord in Jesus' name. In Daniel chapter 3, we're looking at verse 4. He said, Then and hell cried aloud to you, it is commanded, O people and nations and languages. Look at verse 5. That at what time, any time, even if you're sleeping, wake up and worship Nebuchadnezzar's idol. At what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sad bob, sad tree, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, and whoso falleth not down. Whatever his status, whosoever it is, for let not down. Whatever his position or power or connections, whoso for let not down and worship it, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, furry furnace. And then in verse 7, we're told, therefore, at that time when all the people, without exception, except these uh, godly people, heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sad pot, sad tree, and all kinds of uh, music, it says, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Nobody had a mind of his own. Nobody had a decision of his own. Nobody had a conviction of his own. Nobody had manifested, I launched this when I was young. I launched this when I was at home. I launched this when daddy and mommy sat me down and they read the word of God to me. They had no mind of their own, no conviction of their own. When the whole of society went, that's where everybody went. There are people like that today. They go to church on Sunday. They go to weekday meetings in their local church, in, in their fellowship, and they profess that their children of God, their believers, wait until a popular scene or the sway. Wait until the people of the world make an edict and they say this is what everybody will do. That's when you will know whether anyone has conviction or not. But in the case of all these people, because of the great threat and the great tyrant behind it, this is what the did. We're looking at Acts chapter 4 and reading from verse 17. But that it spread no further among the people. Let us strictly command, threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. You remember that Christ, a Savior, a Lord, had given his own disciples what they should do to preach the word and preach repentance in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now, where they were to begin was where they threatened them. And they said they should speak henceforth from this hour, from this day, to no man in this name. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, and they called them, and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. They wanted them to deny Jesus as the only foundation cornerstone of our salvation and to deny him as the Lord and master of their lives and not to teach anything in his name, if you are not going to teach what Christ has said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, what else are you going to teach? And then in verse 19, in verse 19, and Peter and John answered and said unto them, 
whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God. Judge ye, verse 20, in verse 20 it says, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They took their stand, and the Lord will help you to take your stand everywhere in Jesus' name. When the market people want you to contribute money, if you're going to continue in that market, because they're going to worship idol, you must contribute your part. You must be able to take your stand and say, here is where we stand. Here is the word of God. We will not contribute to the worship of any idol. You want to get married and, the, you know, the people, uh, you are marrying uh, the lady from, uh, you are a brother and you know her as a sister. And the parents are saying, we don't know children church will not know bible what we know is their idol and they want you to worship idol and they want you to contribute something you know, as part of the dowry that they will give to their idol that's the time to take your stand but if you want marriage at all cost marriage even if you miss heaven even if you lose heaven i just want to get married you're going to be sucked in into their system and when you are working with somebody is the manager, director, employer, and he demands this is what I want. He says he's not a Christian, he's an idol worshiper, and anybody he gives work to, this is what they must do. And what they are calling you to do is contrary to the word of God. That's when you take your stand. That's when we know who is a believer or who is not a believer. At such a time, I pray you will stand. I will stand. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're looking at verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine and manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, perseverance. We must be able to bear. There is something to persevere in that the, the challenge that will come to you and it talk to you softly, and you say, no, I don't do that. I can't do that. I'm a believer. They report you to higher authorities. And the authority calls you. He has a panel already. Three of them there. And they say, Mr. So-and-so, Madam So-and-so, this is what we do here. This one was established before you came to work here. And so you must do this. Don't carry church here. When you go to your church, practice church. When you go to the place of work, be a dual person. Your part in the church, <laughs> do that over there. But when you come here, this is what you do. And it's contrary to the word of God. You will not deceive. You will not sign something that's not according to the will of God. And then they put the pressure. What do you do? You stand. Then one of them there will tell you, Madam, this one will cost you your job. She drug me shack and a big a go new. This will cost their life. And life is much, much greater than work, than employment. If we're Christians, we must have the doctrine of the word and the manner of life and the purpose and the faith and the long suffering and charity and perseverance. Your um, co workers will call you aside and say, Mr. So and so, we love you so much. We don't want these people to disengage you. We love you so much. We want you to rather go to hell than keep to the word of God and get to heaven. That's when you take your stand and you say, I don't know any other thing. My number one job, my number one desire, my number one manner of life is to get to heaven. And then if you lose your life, if you lose your work, they might say, we told you, but we are going to get a better job. I didn't say a good amen there. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, persecutions. That's Paul. It says, you know my manner of life. You know my persecutions. You know my affliction, which came unto me at Antioch and at Iconium at Lystra. What persecutions I endured. We have to endure it. 
they will threaten and they will they will lay whatever it is on us they'll take some rights away from us our rights but it says i endured but out of them all the lord delivered me look at verse 12 in verse 12 yea and all that will live godly in christ jesus shall suffer persecution all without exception it may begin very near you at home and then it may go to the marketplace may get to the place of work all that will live godly in christ jesus shall suffer persecution look at verse 13 in verse 13 but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived verse 14 it says but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. In Jeremiah chapter 12, uh, some of these things we're, you know, we're experiencing, uh, they're very, very small. They're very, very minor. And they're ordinary. Yet she didn't greet me. Uh-huh. And uh, she didn't respect me. Uh huh. He's not, uh, you know, smiling at me. Uh huh. They are talking behind me. Uh huh. All those things are little, little things compared with what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego has got to ask yourself. What if I were one of those uh, three companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Ask yourself. What if I faced a tyrant? furious, angry, like Nebuchadnezzar, all that you are going through, they'll be as nothing. And that's why it says in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5, if thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee. If all these small, small things that are happening, that you call your own persecution, that you call your own cross, that you call your own difficulty, that you call in your own trials, if all these small things of run were footmen and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with the horses? It's saying if you cannot contend with all those small, small people, when Nebuchadnezzar comes, when a tyrant comes, and when somebody and maybe it comes into your life and you say, So all the convictions you have carried since you became a Christian, you have to drop it. If I'm going to stay with you, if you're going to stay with me, what are you going to do at that time? And even the land of peace, wherein thou trusted, they wearied thee. Then how canst thou do in the swelling of Jordan? We're looking at number three here. Number three here, great trials with a great triumph. Look at John chapter 16. We're looking at verse 30. Hearing the very words of Jesus. These things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace in the world. Here are the words of Christ. In the world, not everybody will pat you on the back. In the world, not everybody will smile at you. If you're a man of conviction, if you're a woman of conviction, in the world, not everybody will say, yes, madam, yes, sir. In the world, not everybody will show respect. Even the ordinary respect, they show to the man, the woman on the street. Not everybody will do that to you. In the world, it says, ye shall have tribulation, trial, testing, threats, threatenings, and tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And because you are connected to Christ, and you are so linked to Christ, and you will not turn back, you'll overcome the world in Jesus' name. In First Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 6, First Peter chapter 1, verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, always notice that for a season, it's not forever, for a season, it's only in this life, for a season, only a few years, stay there, endure that thing, and remain under that pressure and remain under the threatening and the tribulation is for a season don't talk 
don't see any foolish thing uh, don't abuse don't don't be like the world don't fight back don't retaliate don't revenge just stay there quiet with your heart offering prayer unto the lord and praises unto the lord your heart adoring god and worshiping god for the grace he gives you he says it's for a season if need be ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations in verse 7 it says that the trial of your faith that the purpose that the receive that's what they want to get away from you your faith when the son of man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? The people that have been so much under pressure that the things they do to them in the world and the things they threaten them with in the world will suck their faith away and they will not be like they were in the earlier years of their Christian faith. But you want to understand that whatever pressure may be there, it is the trial of your faith being much more precious than, the, than gold that perishes though it be tried with fire might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of jesus christ it tells us in verse 8 in verse 8 it says so have you not seen ye love and in whom do now ye see him not yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory verse 9 verse 9 says receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls first peter chapter 4 verse 12 in verse 12 beloved think it not strange concerning the fairy trials which is come to try you as though some strange things happened unto you. Already we have been told, everyone that will live godly shall suffer persecution. Everyone, everyone. The, the young people, they suffer persecution too in, at school, in their communities, the fathers, the mothers, the adults. We all suffer persecution because of what we stand for and how we stand for what we stand for. And so when it comes to you and you too, you are standing for righteousness and you are standing for Christ and you are standing for the word and the will of God, trials will come. Think it not strange concerning the very trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Look at verse 13. In verse 13 it says, but rejoice. Many people mama, but rejoice. Many people complain, but rejoice. Many people become afraid. They are timid and they are fearful. This is happening today. I don't know what will happen tomorrow. I'm not enjoying life. I'm not enjoying this. They are complaining. But he said, don't complain, but rejoice as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, of Christ's suffering. If you are partaker of his salvation, if you are partaker of his supply, if you are partaker of the provision he has made it says we also partake in Christ's suffering when his glory shall be revealed and ye that ye may be glad also with exceeding joy amen in every life we're looking at point number two now point number two we're looking at the coercion of godly companions through the king's domination now, uh, coercion is a uh, pressure. Coercion uh, is people pushing you. And even when they push you to the wall, they keep on pushing you as if they want to drive you into the wall. Our nature, natural nature, natural climate, natural thing, uh, we don't like coercion. We don't like anybody that talks rough, that acts rough, that pushes us that doesn't even take care you're going to injure me as you they don't care for that coercion is to put pressure on you is to make the fire hot so that you will run out either you run out of the christian faith or you run out of your place of work or you run out of your ministry or you run out of your calling or you run out of your marriage 
when uh, the people, whether they are in laws, whoever they are, when they make the fire very hot, when everybody talks, when they get the heart, the might of their son, 